the topic of my talk is not exactly, um, you know, like, hey, this is the research that I do and everybody should know about that. That's not what I kind of set out to do uh, with this talk. Um, instead, I really wanted to give um, kind of a, a sampling of the sort of things that are happening in research land that are kind of hard to, unless you're like digging and reading all the papers all the time and keeping up on it, like it's kind of hard to see a snapshot of the, of the landscape. Um, and um, before, I, before I kind of get going, um, I kind of want to give a little bit of a pitch about, you know, I think research is actually very interesting and I think that we could all um, learn a lot from just trying to keep up with broadly what's going on. And uh, in order to sort of make that point, I guess the first thing I want to say is, well, um, we have this idea that research is not really actually very fast moving, it's slow, um, but I really think it's super animated. Um, I think that most people think that this is what research looks like. Um, there's some, some, some person hiding in a cave, uh, reading, reading PDFs all day and then writing uh, things that are totally, totally difficult for anybody else other than that one person who wrote it to understand. And they often are looking at like, you know, totally contrived problems and they don't care about reality. Like this is sort of, I think, what people uh, have come to think at least in many of the programming communities that I, I kind of frequent, and I, I've, I beg to differ. I actually really don't think that's the case, and I think we should change our, our view of it. Actually, I think research looks a little bit more like this. These are, it looks a little weird, like it's a weird race, uh, and nobody's sure from the onset of the race, like really what the race is about, but later we, find, we kind of get it. We're like, okay, they were trying to get to the top of that building in a really weird way. Um, and one of them won, right? But the thing is that we, I guess we, what we don't see when we're thinking about things as being like these big crusty piles of PDFs is that, you know, this is actually what it look li looks like uh, where you have people kind of making these steps, jumping up, jumping up like the next window in this little animation uh, with a couple of arguments that they put into one of these PDFs. And if you're not kind of, you know, reading these things regularly, you kind of can't see this, this, this like dynamic multi-year long sort of animated debate between these researchers on different sides of the planet, right? Um, and I, I hope by the end of the talk, because I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I don't know, I, I forget the number of, of papers or efforts that I'm just gonna quickly touch upon. Um, but I hope at the end of this, basically, you know, you see this, you know, some of these like jargon terms uh, in a different light. You see them in a light where, you know, these are arguments that kind of happen quickly over time and, you know, quickly maybe in like the last three years there's some animated debate happening, but, you know, you hear, you hear somebody using big words at some conference and you're not quite sure what it means and like, you know, it seems totally inaccessible, but I hope to kind of give you like a, well, actually, here are how these pieces are connected. Like, that's my goal in this talk. I'm not, you're not going to become an expert in anything, you're just going to have a quick kind of high level skim of, of the research landscape in distributed programming uh, or, lang or language support for distributed programming. Uh, so again, this talk is really about context, it's about uh, just kind of giving you, you know, a, a quick, quick, quick overview of the tour, uh, or sorry, of, of language support for distributed programming. And on that, on that note, um, I want to say that uh, I care a lot about programming languages and compilers, so I'm a little bit biased in this space. Uh, one thing that tends to get lumped into the category of programming support or programming language support is also efforts like verification um, or static analysis, uh, which is also very cool, but that's like exploding the solution or the, the space that I can, I can touch on today. So it's going to be a little bit more biased on the programming languages compiler side of things. Um, and just to kind of give like a, a bit of intuition, I have this, a uh, hilarious little plot where the axes mean nothing, but the idea is to kind of, you know, if I could, if I could map out where p various efforts exist, various research ex uh, efforts exist in sort of some kind of space, uh, it looks kind of like this, where you have little clusters of, of, of areas, right? Um, one area that has seen a lot of attention recently is uh, the idea of bringing consistency uh, into programming models and then trying to provide some guarantees about consistency, you know, at the level of the language or a compiler or something. Another thing that you might have heard of a lot lately uh, is this, this area of active research called session types, um, which, set, you know, broadly stated, it's all about uh, proving things about communication protocols uh, in some kind of type system. Uh, and then, you know, maybe there's a, like a, 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 a group or a, a cluster of 
of you know, static analysis and verification efforts. And then you have all of these other things that don't fit neatly into one of these categories. And today, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not much of a verification person, uh, I'm gonna talk more about you know, some of these major sort of research thrusts, like what it's all about, high level picture, and then some other things that are really interesting that maybe don't get as much attention. Um, and you know, I'm gonna start with consistency because I think that's, a, that's something that um, we're all starting to hear a lot about uh, lately, at least. Uh, I mean, if you care about databases, if you live in the databases world, uh, consistency is nothing new, but if you care about programming languages research, consistency is becoming an interesting topic once again. Um, and what do I mean by this? I mean, um, you know, uh, by consistency in the, in, in, in the context of distributed programming, I mean, you know, we're, let's, let's look at programming models or, or languages or compilers that provide some kind of consistency guarantee that you might want. Um, and so an example um, might be that, you know, so we can't completely get rid of uh, mutable data ever. Like, I mean, we can make many things mutable, but sometimes things have to be mutable. Um, and in that case, uh, what happens if I have to replicate a piece of mutable data? Uh, what, you know, what guarantees do I have about what I can see uh, and what others might be able to see? So if, if I have a replica and somebody else has a replica of the same piece of data, that other person makes some kind of update to it, is there some kind of guarantee about what I should see? Um, as soon as that person makes an update to that data, do I see it or do I see it later, right? Um, and uh, you know, like what, what are the guarantees that I can expect? So this is what I mean. Um, and, you know, until recently, um, people have decided, or, you know, they have, the assumption has just been naturally like, okay, we want, we, we assume strong consistency because, you know, in the single machine, the single threaded scenario, you know, typically that's what you have, right? You have, uh, you know, there's an update made to something, and then immediately after that update is made, then we can all see that update. Um, but, you know, in recent years, it became evident that, um, sometimes weak consistency is, is actually okay. Um, not every need to know, every, not every node needs to be in sync before uh, you know computation should be able to restart again. We don't have to block, right? Um, and you know, there's plenty of examples. Uh, for example, you would want strong consistency if you you know if your data was like the account balance in a bank account, right? Obviously, we don't want weak consistency there because then you can have uh, all kinds of problems where you know you subtract amounts of money before the amounts get deposited. Not good, right? But you know, maybe for something like a like counter on Facebook, it's okay if we're not like blocking everything just to like increment the like counter. That would be, you know, maybe that's maybe we can deal with weak consistency there, right? So um, in, in the last few years, it be, has become evident that hey, it's okay in some cases to have uh, this, you know, this eventual consistency or weak consistency uh, for some things, but in other things we want strong consistency. Uh, and then how do we reconcile that at the level of the programming language? Is there a way that we can let people make these decisions with their programming tools? Tools. Um, and uh, there's, so I, I don't like uh, talking a lot about the cap theorem because I think it's it's something that you know it's it's a it's a it's a concept that people are kind of it, it gets more attention than it deserves. However, um, I think we need it as like a guiding post, if, you know, for understanding some of the pieces of research I'm going to mention in a moment. Um, and really, what this so there's this thing called the cap theorem. It's uh, uh, you know it, it's it's sort of it, it's, a, it's a theorem that has, been, has basically been driving a lot of research related to consistency in programming models. Um, and basically what it says is um, when there are some process in a system that uh, you know, can't communicate or uh, you know, they are partitioned, we have to uh, sacrifice something, right? Um, it's kind of a pick two thing, right? So on the one hand, um, we can choose to sacrifice uh, availability or we can choose to sacrifice consistency, right? But we assume that we're going to have to deal with failures uh, in the network or, our, or, or the system that we're running on. Um, and uh, you know, the, there, there are various models that have actually popped up that fall on, whoops, that fall on, uh, well, in this case, the CRDT's work. Um, uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about that in a minute. It, it chooses one side of that pyramid, right? So it chooses these two, right? It chooses uh, it chooses basically, what did I say, AP. Uh, it chooses, yeah, uh, availability and partition tolerance, and it sacrifices consistency, right? Um, and so the idea is that you can kind of play around a little bit with, this, with, with you know, these trade-offs on this pyramid. Um, and this model, I think, that a lot of people have heard of in recent years called uh, CRDTs, it's an acronym that's kind of popular these days, um, 
they, they, so it stands for Conflict-Free Replicated Data Types, um, and it was proposed in 2011 by Mark Shapiro and his group. Um, and like I said, it, it, it sort of focuses on this one part of the pyramid, right? Uh, and the idea is that, you know, if you have a, a data structure that you, you, you make a replica and you put it on a different node, um, that this, this is a kind of a restricted data model where what you can do is, you know, you can always be guaranteed that in any order that people make updates, uh, the, the updates will be propagated all around the network and merged uh, in a way where every, you can be guaranteed once things coalesce that, you know, everybody should see the same state. So you don't have to worry about the order of updates and whatnot. Um, all, all, rep, all of these up, uh, replicas will be uh, uh, strongly eventually consistent is what they, is what they say. Right? And this is something, it's kind of neat because uh, these things have popped up all over the place. They've popped up, uh, I mean, if you've heard of React, it's, uh, you know, they were, uh, are kind of core to, to this database called React, but they've also popped up in other various uh, places. I think Akka has support for them now. Um, and I think TomTom has done something with, with, with CRDTs. But, you know, they're, it's, it's an idea that's being exercised nowadays, which is kind of cool. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's one step. There's, there's, then there's been work built on top of that, right? Um, so this is, I think this is kind of interesting. It's, it's work by uh, Chris Mickeljohn and Peter Van Roy a couple of years back. Uh, and the idea is, hey, um, fine, let's pretend that we have these CRDT things as data types. Uh, but let's, allow, let's, let's kind of build this into a functional language that allows, us, uh, that allows for composition. So we have these eventually consistent data types, and then we can have things like higher order functions and stuff like that on these, on these data types as if it was, you know, if it was, yeah, if it was just in some functional language that you're already uh, enjoying to use. So the idea is, you know, let's, let's compose up richer and more interesting comp uh, computations uh, with sort of like a, a compositional version of these CRDT things. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, you know, one, one branch of work where, okay, we have these CRDT things, we choose this space in the pyramid, uh, and then, you know, here's a, here's, a, here's a model, which everybody seems to like, and then let's build on top of that model. Like, what can we do? What can we put on top of it? Um, but there are also other, you know, as I mentioned, there's these, these points in this, in, this, in this pyramid, in this design space. We don't, a lot of efforts are really focusing on, on this, uh, you know, AP side of it. But, you know, we could also focus on another part of that triangle and experiment with sort of other trade-offs in this consistency, availability, and uh, partition tolerance space. Um, and uh, one, so this one work here, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a position paper, uh, again, by Chris. So Chris was working on this. Uh, CRDT based language, and then he's like, "Hey, well, what about what about other other parts of that of that pyramid?" Uh, and so he proposed something called Spry, which is a programming model that actually explores the uh, the con like you know prioritizes consistency and availability. Um, uh, and so basically, the idea is um, he's got. Uh, uh, support for these 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 um, these APIs that can guarantee something about staleness or, or, or freshness. So you have annotations, and you say uh, that you know I want uh, I want this this piece of data uh, to be you know at least as fresh as something, right? Um, so the point here is that you can bound things with uh, staleness and freshness, or pieces of data with staleness and, staleness and freshness uh, annotations. Um, so you know, and again, the point here is is you know, let's let's trade off on different things in that in that pyramid, and let's um, let's let's give uh, the the developer a handle to choose uh, what you know what freshness or staleness guarantees they want, right? Um, so that's you know some you know an example of some research kind of saying, okay, well, let's explore another another area in this space. Um, but on top of all of this, so okay, we have CRDTs. Uh, we have people building little languages on top of CRDTs, and we have uh, people arguing about doing stuff uh, in other parts of this funny cap triangle. Um, but then, right, you know, then arises the question: like, well, what if I, uh, you know, what if I start wanting to mix um, mix consistency guarantees within one one programming model or one language? Um, and what's cool is that this, this is some work that came out of the distributed systems community. I think um, a lot of the time when you see some, some of these programming models, it comes out of the either uh, programming languages community or the databases community. Uh, but this came out of the distributed systems community, and what's neat about it is it's kind of like, uh, so the work is, these things are called correctables. It's by um, some theoretical distributed fo system folks at, uh, at, at EPFL, uh, Rashid uh, Grari and his students. Uh, and the, the, the abstraction or the concept is, is called correctables, and really what the idea is, is to provide um, incremental consistency guarantees. So kind of think about futures. Uh, and, you know, 
we want to capture successive changes uh, to some value of a replicated object, and we provide uh, we pr provide a way to the programmer to opt into different kinds of uh, of uh, consistency sort of guarantees that we want, right? So um, in one case, you know, you can say, uh, you know. In this, for this piece of data right now, eventual consistency is acceptable, but later on in your application, you can say, look, I need, I need something that's strongly consistent right now. So you force the whole system to coordinate, for example. But you, you have, you have a, a, you know, an API call for that. Um, and just, I mean, you know, again, these are all just quick high-level ideas. Um, I encourage you to dig into the paper if you want to get into more detail. But sort of the main three kind of APIs that you can think of being provided to programmers is, well, uh, you know, these operations called uh, invoke weak, invoke strong, and then there's a special invoke that has, uh, you know, an e extra parameter for something called a level. Um, but in both of these cases, or in all three of these cases, what you're doing is, you know, you're, you're providing some kind of operation and then you're telling the system, don't, don't worry too much about, uh, you know, coordinating. Definitely coordinate, and this is kind of like something in the middle where uh, you can you can set a level for how much to coordinate, and there's a lot more detail in the paper about that that API. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea is that you know we we uh, it's, it's these things look sort of like futures, and you want to uh, be able to say at certain points in your application where where it's okay uh, that things you know you have availability instead of instead of consistency or vice versa. Um, and that's, that's some cool work uh, from the distributed systems community. And just this year, there's uh, another piece of work that came out of the programming languages community. Uh, this was uh, presented just this June at PLDI. Um, and the idea here is uh, um, to try and you know, help people mix different consistency um, options, and then to have the compiler help you when you do something wrong. So if you, you, you mix strong and weak consistency at some point, at least, you know, in a way that violates a consistency guarantee down the road, uh, you know, the compiler should be able to help you here is the idea. Um, and this is all done. Um, so they have, there's this, I mean, just to give you a quick high level taste of what this, what sort of things that this thing uh, gives you, uh, you basically have to associate consistency models with remote storage sites. Um, and then you can do uh, transactions on these things. So, and you can, uh, each transaction can access um, a mixture of data with different consistency models. And using compile time information flow sort of checking, um, you can ensure that these, that these models, that these different consistency models are mixed safely. Uh, so the compiler then can automatically partition track the transactions. So it's like catching you from doing something bad and then also doing some automatic partitioning for you to prevent you from mixing two consistency models in a bad way. It's kind of the quick, quick high-level view of this. And this was uh, published at PLDI, there's some, some uh, which means that there's also some uh, practical results that you can look at in this paper, but it's also a lot of Greek. Um, okay, so that's the consistency stuff. I didn't touch upon everything, but I wanted to give you some different kind of, uh, you know, conversations that are kind of being had in that research space. Um, and I think this is all very interesting because also uh, for a long time now, uh, the distributed systems community and the databases community have been calling on uh, the programming languages community to actually pay attention to your consistency model. So this is cool that this is becoming much more interesting all of a sudden. And I hope that in the next few years, some of these ideas are going to be better hashed out and put into uh, real products. Um, but another thing that is, is getting a lot of attention in recent years is uh, this thing called session types. Um, and you know, you can think of these things as, as kind of uh, types for communication protocols. So um, broadly, broadly, that means uh, if you have a program that type checks, so you have a communication protocol that you somehow encode in this type system, uh, and if the program type checks that you, 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 know, you use this pro uh, communication protocol with, then it's guaranteed to follow that, that defined communication protocol, which practically speaking, that means that you know, these things that happen where you try to implement your own communication protocol and then you do something silly and like three machines are hanging and crashing because they didn't get something they expected and then everything breaks, uh, you have fewer of those errors, right? Like, actually, you should have none of those kinds of errors. Uh, so this is supposed to statically, statically, or in some cases, dynamically guarantee that you don't do this. Um, and it's important to note, so this is, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's for, for many years, this has been more of an academic kind of uh, area that people were kind of exploring. Um, and, you know, in recent years, so over the years, uh, we started first with this idea of binary, uh, binary session, session types, 
which um, were basically between two nodes, right? Like, so typing between two specific uh, parties, you know, in communication. Uh, and then this has eventually been extended to being able to deal with multiple parties, so sort of communication protocols between more than two nodes. Uh, and um, as you can imagine, you know, we have different, there's, there's you know, a static, static and dynamic variants of these things as well. So for languages that have a static type system, which that you, you know, you can extend, et cetera, uh, you might imagine then that your, your session typing system would be static and there's also dynamic, 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 uh, dynamic systems. And just to give you a quick example that um, I really want to call some attention to. So I'm not a researcher in the whole session typing space and I wanted to quickly find, I wanted to find an example that would be very quick to deliver to you guys, just to give some sense of what this thing looks like. If you uh, have no idea or exposure to it, I found this example. Actually, it's it's by Simon Fowler, and he has a really really great um, uh, introduction to session types. And, and I encourage you to to have a look at it because there aren't so many so so many really great and easy to access uh, um, um, resources out there. So highly recommended. Um, but this is so this so basically th this quick cute example uh, is you know. Implement like an implementation of uh, the SMT protocol, um, and so these are the types. On um, you have kind of a client side and a server side, uh, and you have this funny plus operator thing here, which basically means uh, you know you have to you, basically it. it uh, it's a selection symbol. It says you can choose between these two branches, this EHLO or this like protocol end quit uh, branch. And in the case of the EHLO uh, example, there's this bang operator, this exclamation point. Uh, and this basically means that the client sends the domain, um, the from address that the, that the, the, the message should be sent from, where it should be sent to, another address, the actual contents of the message, and then the uh, protocol should repeat, right? So that's the one branch, and then the other branch is, uh, well, the, the, the protocol ends. And on the, oops, yeah, here we are. So uh, send, bunch of information, repeat, and the protocol ends. Uh, and on the server side, you have the dual of that, kind of like the receive version. Um, so rather than offering a selection like we did in this case, this, uh, this end thing is, is basically making a choice. Um, so, you know, you can choose between these two branches, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, it's the same, actually the same idea. So rather than uh, sending, it's receiving or selecting. Rather than selecting, it's, it's, um, it's offering a choice. Uh, so, I mean, this is like hello world. It's, it's very simple. It's not meant to like, uh, you know, break your, break your mind here. Um, but this is kind of the, you know, the type, the type, whoops, the type definition, right, of the, of the, of the, sort of communication protocol. And then this is how you would implement a client. Um, so, you know, it, it's not super surprising. You're basically uh, taking a function, or so you have a function that takes a channel um, with, you know, with session type uh, SMTP client. So this is how you get in the, that, that extra type checking. And then the various parameters that you need uh, that we talked about before. Uh, and then, um, you know, what happens is sending a value results in a, um, new channel endpoint being bound upon each cent, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, th that's the basic idea. I, the, the point, that, so there's all these Cs here. Um, you can think of this as kind of, uh, you know, like, uh, we're, we're every, think, of it, think of it as kind of immutable here, where these are just, you know, independent steps, right? But uh, it's, it's just the, an implementation of the protocol. And if this type checks, the idea is that, you know, there's no way for this, this communication protocol to, to ever break. Um, and so there, if, you, if you pick up any of these research papers about, about session types, uh, you're going to find that there's a lot of, a lot of Greek letters in them. Um, and, uh, you know, that could be off-putting if you care more about practical, practical systems being built with these things. Uh, so uh, I'd like to let you know that there exists plenty of um, implementations of, of, of various sorts of session types in several different languages. This list is not exhaustive. Um, but ones that you might have heard of before, uh, session types in Rust. Uh, this is a little bit um, on the more popular side. But Scala has some called uh, L channels. There's a popular um, uh, uh, framework in Java called Scribble. And some of these are um, binary. I believe Rust, Rust's, uh, Rust, Scala's, and Haskell's um, systems listed here are binary um, session typing systems. And then the rest, uh, Erlang, C, J uh, Java and Python are, are, are multi-party frameworks. But, you know, just to show that their stuff is being like exercised, right? And you can, you can play around and look at it if you're interested. Um, and if you're, you know, if you want to go further, 
good starting point is this blog article by Simon Fowler. And uh, there's a lot of folks that you might have heard of before that are actually working on this stuff actively right now. So one good way of keeping up with what's going on is to look at you know, what they're doing to follow their publications. Um, OK, so I just talked about consistency programming models and distributed programming consistency. And I talked about, uh, you know, there's this thing called session types. Uh, and a lot of people are working on it. Um, but there's, you know, as I mentioned, like there's like all these other little points in that, that funny space. And I wanted to quickly run through a few of those because, you know, there's not huge piles of people working on these topics, but I think they're pretty neat. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to cover a few projects that don't fit neatly into those categories that I provided. Um, the first one is actually, I'm really excited about this one. Um, this was, I think, last year at, I yeah, uh, obviously, the big letters, uh, last year at ICFP. Um, and this is a uh, contract system for microservices, basically. Um, and this is really neat because I don't feel that the academic community cares too much about this whole microservice movement, whereas I come to um, any sort of industrial conference, and if I say the word microservice, everybody starts rolling their eyes because it's just like enough of this already, everybody is doing this, right? Uh, and it's weird that, uh, you know, there's all of these problems with these things, especially if you have like, you know, imagine like a, a graph of microservices, right? Like each team kind of works on one and, you know, one is consuming outputs from another. Um, and then you have one, one service in this graph that spits something out that breaks services down the, down the chain, right? And then a bunch of services down this chain start doing, you know, unexpected things and get, people get pissed, right? Somebody has to wake up in the middle of the night and try to fix it. That's annoying. Um, and so, you know, to try and solve some of these problems, uh, this, this, this thing called WIP is basically uh, contracts, like racket contracts, uh, but to try and prevent those kind of things from happening. And what's really neat is that um, their design constraints, maybe, maybe people in this room think this is totally obvious, but um, I'm happy that they put this in front of academics and they said, these are important things to, to worry about. One, that the system should still operate under partial deployment. Seems obvious, right? But, you know, in an academic context, that's not the most obvious point. Um, okay, we don't want it to mess with communication. Uh, it should definitely be language agnostic because in every microservice framework, whatever that you've ever used, um, you know, every team is using a different language. They're writing in Ruby or Python or whatever, right? So you shouldn't be married to one specific language. Uh, and then it should also be able to accommodate the loose coupling of, of these things and, and also be uh, um, you know, compatible with things like Thrift or these existing wire protocols that we all use to sort of pass information between services, uh, which that's really cool. Um, and I encourage you to have a look at it. Um, there's, uh, I don't, I'm not sure it's, it's still being developed, but it's a really cool idea. Uh, and like I said, it's called WIP, and there's a few talks about it if you're interested. Another thing that you might have heard of, um, if you, especially if you hang out in the Scala community, is this new language or DSL uh, called Unison. Um, it's currently under development. It's not an academic project in that, like, it's not a university doing it. It's actually uh, three really smart guys that work in the Scala community uh, who, are, who have gotten funding to build this new language. Um, and the key idea is to have this, you know, Haskell-like language, uh, but you want to be able to move computations around, and these computations are moved around, um, you know, via interpretation. So it's like abstract interpretation, moving computations around. Um, and, you know, it's, it's neat. Um, it's currently a proof of concept, and they haven't worked out all of the distribution issues yet, uh, but they have a compiler and they have a language running, and it's called Unison, and I encourage you to have a look at it. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting, just to know that it exists in case... Uh, uh, in case it ever comes up, is this language called Syndicate, which is all about, um, uh, well, it's, it, you know, again, it's in the, con in the context of kind of uh, communication protocols and actors and things, but uh, it, it recently developed into um, uh, kind of a new take on tuple spaces. So there's this idea of data spaces uh, in this language. Um, and, you know, the whole idea there is to try and, re like, you know, the argument is that point-to-point, uh, sorry, point-to-point -point communication is bad. Um, because it's just a lot of effort that you have to invest in trying to make sure that two parties are talking. Uh, so let's have a, a model that's a little bit more declarative. Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is a PhD thesis that was just last year. Um, there are a couple of tutorials about it, and also um, I, I, I would never normally recommend that anybody should ever look at a PhD thesis, uh, but this is an exception um, because this, this, the Tony is an amazing writer. So uh, if you're ever interested, uh, have a look at, at, at this thesis. Um, 
And uh, another thing that, that, that exists that maybe, this is a few years back, um, and it's a, it's a project that I think was quite ahead of its time. Um, it's uh, a system that's it's, it's a, basically a, a version of, of ML that's based on modal logic. Uh, and it kind of, what it does is it, it provides, so you have these mobile closures in this language, uh, and this, this you know, interesting type system is basically all about trying to uh, you know, reason about um, applying functions or using functions in the right place. So you know, don't use a function in a certain place where uh, you don't have the resources for that. Um, so let's try to catch that in the type system. Uh, and this is, this is a language called ML5. Uh, which just you know, it's a it's a cool it's a cool language that you know I think doesn't it was ahead of its time and I don't think it gets enough attention. Um, this is something that we recently did last year, or this year I guess technically it's been a little while. Um, so this is a, a programming model for it's kind of like a distributed uh, uh, like you know immutable piece of data that represents uh, like a DAG of computation that can be spread between different nodes. And then the idea is that rather than sending messages between nodes, you apply functions uh, to data on different nodes, right? So it's kind of like an inverted version of the actor model. It's called function passing. Uh, we published it this year the, in the Journal of Functional Programming. Um, and yeah, we've, we've implemented this uh, in Scala. It's not, you know, it's, it's more of an ex experiment. We found that we could actually, I mean, you know, put things like Spark or whatever, this kind of model of computation on top of it, but we found also that the, the model works for all kinds of other sorts of uh, applications, right? Um, so those are just like a few things that don't fit into this like nice, nice categories, right? Um, um, but there's a couple of, I, I figured, you know, now I can mention a few projects uh, that uh, we hope in our group, uh, you know, will move the, the needle in some way. Um, so, uh, I'm inspired by that WIP work that, about the microservices, um, and actually, uh, before I, I, I talk about the project that we're just getting started on, we wrote this paper that was hilariously rejected in flames, um, like really angry flames, at a, a systems conference. And oh, it's actually a systems workshop, so you really have to have, like they really have to be pissed off at you if, you're, if they reject your workshop paper in flames. So. Um, <laughs> usually you're not so angry at workshop papers, but this was an exception. We were, it's, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. We were kind of trying to make fun of them a little bit um, because, you know, we took, we made a title that sounded like, you know, man, the systems community would love this. So we're going to be verifying interfaces between container-based components. So like microservice, we're verifying things, you know, whatever, components, that sounds awesome. And then in little letters we write, or a type system by any other name, because if you look at it, it's kind of like typing components, right? Oh my God. So we taught them about what a type system was and then we proposed something and they got angry at us. Um, well, that's fine. Uh, so we're still working on this. Um, and um, this is a project that I'm getting started with um, a collaborator uh, who's not at CMU, um, but we've got a couple of students getting involved in this project now. Um, so hopefully we're gonna see something in that space eventually. Um, another thing that uh, doesn't seem very sexy um, upon initial glance, but hopefully maybe down the line people will appreciate it, um, is basically being able to statically guarantee that um, program fragments or functions or things that you actually want to execute are, you know, on, on, especially on replicated data. So in particular, we care about replicated data, but in general, uh, we want to ensure that these things are monotone. So they, you know, whatever they're doing, it's monotonic to whatever they're doing it to. Uh, and so we have a little type system for this, and this is with my PhD student, Kevin Clancy. Um, and this is something that, you know, it's, it's all Greek right now. It's not anything that we've ever put into a real language yet. Uh, we just want to see if we can do this and if it could ever be potentially like, usable. Uh, and this is important because monotonicity is extremely uh, important for things like CRDTs, um, but just in general, consistency. So if you want to make any sort of consistency guarantee about anything, uh, you, need, you need to basically be assuming that things are monotonic. And so we're like, well, actually it turns out that it's really hard to look at something and determine whether it's monotone or antitone or some other tone, right? Wouldn't it be cool if just the compiler could tell us that? Um, and it turns out that, you know, we have a way it, it works. Um, but yeah, so... Um, this, if, if I bring back this hilarious little picture that I, I provided with not real axes, um, my work uh, and the work of the, of the students and, and, and collaborators that we work with, we're not in these big clusters of like session types or, or these things. We have these kind of, you know, on the, you know, in the middle of the space kind of uh, research projects, which, uh, you know, I think, I think are also pretty cool. But, um, you know, if you care about uh, any of these sorts of directions, whether it be the stuff on the fringe or some of these main areas, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of researchers uh, that 
if you just kind of keep in mind, you know, who these folks are, you can see, you can more easily kind of track what's going on in this space. Um, and so I, you know, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just a number of folks all over the planet that are working on uh, various things in this area. Um, and I, I've missed lots of people, but I just kind of quickly grabbed some to look here. You can follow some of these folks if you're interested. At least it gives you something, uh, something to look at that's a little bit more, you know, like you can, you can it's easier to find uh, some of these efforts. Um, and I have, uh, you know, you can, you can see these on my slides. Um, I, will, I will post the slides for you. But uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, there's millions and millions of papers, not millions, but several papers, um, kind of going through some of the, some of the works that I, I covered and then a few more that kind of fall between the cracks. So uh, if, you, if you are interested, these are going to be in the slides. Uh, I'll put them online. Uh, but otherwise, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody's got any. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that was like a useful kind of like, here's, here are the, here are the, land, here's the landscapes, here are the mountains, this is what they look like. Um, but uh, if, uh, yeah, any questions or, or pointers or anything, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Questions? You also, I mean, are exhausted, understandably. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't blame you. <laughs> this one. Uh, the, uh, the WIP uh, paper or project, so that's runtime, not the contract tests like PACT or anything. I'm sorry? The WIP that you mentioned. Yeah. Is that runtime contract? Yes, it's runtime contract. It's not, not a contract test. In no, no, no it's, run, it's like, a, yeah, it's a very good question because this is one of those alias words. Uh, yes, it's runtime contracts like I'll, uh, I mean, the Racket programming language makes, it does a lot with those. And um, this is a thing in Racket, but yes, it's runtime contracts a la Racket. Any more questions? Like there. Uh, so with the session type stuff, um, that will verify that a client that obeys the protocol and a server that obeys the protocol can talk to each other correctly. Yep. Uh, what if one of them or the other doesn't obey the uh, protocol? Does it what verify? If one or the other what? Does not obey the protocol. Uh, well, then the code should, like, then it shouldn't type check. Is the idea? I mean. Um, yeah, but it, like if someone else writes a client that doesn't so obey the that, protocol, but your a, server does. Question. That's a good question. So this is kind of like you know how am I compiling this stuff? Like how open is my world that I'm compiling? Right? Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that there's like a really good answer. Uh, this is not my area, so I, I don't know that answer. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's gotta be some proposition that people are making about like linking with other libraries or something, or you're just not allowed to have something that hasn't been compiled by that compiler with like the ability to see everything. I'm sure there's like some smart answer to that, but I, I do not know what it is. But that's a good question. Like, here's a way I can think of to break this. Yes, you're thinking the right way. <laughs> How does versioning sit, it's probably the same question, but how does versioning sit in with this? And is it considered- Session in typing a, stuff? Not just session types, but uh. Uh, sort of, um, well, for example, the WIP constraint is, was it had to be under yeah. partial deployment. So if you're rolling Man, out- that's one of those like super hard questions to answer because like every single person who it, like thinks about it does something totally different to solve it, right? Um, and because I'm like the person giving the high level picture, like I, had, I did not survey like all the different things that people have tried and I bet you five bucks that some of these things which are more research projects probably haven't cared too much about versioning yet because they just wanna see if they can have some system running or whatever and they don't care about versioning, I don't know. Um, so the answer is that, um, with, with, yeah, it's a very good question, it's a super important practical question and there's only one work that I know of that might have even thought to answer it, at least in the contract, in the contract space. But the other things, uh, it's mostly more just Greek. It's mostly more like, I have a type system, and that the, the versioning stuff is actually probably more of a, uh, you know, not something that's, that's part of the type system. So it could either be an organizational or an engineering sort of challenge that would be solved by an implementation of one of these things. Um, but you wouldn't put versioning in a type system, I guess, in any of these cases. So for, for so the answer, you say yes? Yes, you would? Okay. What's up? So you've mentioned a few approaches you think are underrated. Are there any really popular approaches you think are overrated? Are any of these, po are any of these approaches popular? Just in general in the space that you think is like super overrated? Too much no, actually, no. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I think I'm much more optimistic. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, you know, like, I think 
you know, actor, so I, I think message passing is awesome and I think that everybody who is sort of jumping on that bandwagon is, is generally doing the right thing. Although I think that, um, you know, there's just a lot of problems that we've been talking about for like 30 years that we haven't solved or even come close to solving uh, in these actor systems. And it's kind of unfortunate because, um, you know, just sort of amplifying the things that people have been talking about for 30 years, but it doesn't, you don't have like, you know, some formal reasoning framework or something or whatever that's in practice solving those problems yet. And I'm kind of confused, like, why not? It's, we've known about these problems for a long time. Um, you know, we have a lot of smart people working on it. So I think that, I don't think, so to summarize, I'm not saying actor systems are overrated. I'm just sad that some of these ideas that could help actor systems a lot don't get uptaken in real actor systems. Uh, so it's not, it's not actor systems are overrated. It's like, please actor systems absorb some of these, these things that seem to have worked in the research. Uh, that's what I would really like to see. But the other things, um, I, don't, I really don't think anything is overrated. I think that we just could give more attention to some things that are still introducing problems for decades. All right, thank you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you.